Hello, and welcome to Secrets of Saturn. I am Jason Lindgren, your host. On this episode, The Great Debate, Round Earth versus Flat Earth. On the Round Earth side, we have Dr. Johan Oldenkamp. Johan was a professor of knowledge transfer, innovation, and entrepreneurship at the Stenton University. In the autumn of 2008, he consciously resigned that appointment in order to devote all his time, energy, and savings to the further development of holy science. Since then, he lives, by his own choice, without income from a job or unemployment benefit. Before his professorship, Johan worked as a researcher and lecturer at the University of Groningen as a member of the scientific staff of the Dutch Telematics Institute, as a management consultant at Ernst & Young Consulting and its successors, as a freelance trainer, teacher, consultant, and coach, and as a martial arts teacher. Johan graduated in cognitive psychology. Next, he completed a postgraduate education in knowledge engineering, and he got a PhD for researching how to combine artificial intelligence heuristics with operations research algorithms. On the Flat Earth side, we have Watson Atkinson from the coast of Portland, Maine, via Georgia, where he came of age, and Indiana, where he was born. Watson Atkinson has been a visual artist and a seeker his entire life and has a huge back catalog of work in numerous disciplines and motifs. After leaving art school in early 1993 as a young artisan, he was catapulted into a career as a tattooist with a 23-year yield to this day. Over the last seven years, he has awoken to the dark undercurrents of the control matrix that we are entrenched within. With years of exposure to every topic within the alternative media, in the spring of 2015, he had found himself in the early trenches of the burgeoning new Flat Earth movement. He has researched far and wide, being well-versed in this alarming topic, and is here to represent the truth movement at large and the exponentially growing Flat Earth awakening. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. It's also a pleasure for me to be in your show. Well, to start off here, let's do a little bit of introductions. Watson, why don't you go first? Hello, I'm Watson Atkinson. I'm from Portland, Maine, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, here representing, uh, uh, I guess, the truth community at large in this flat Earth conversation. So I'm pretty excited about this narrative, and I'm just going to represent a general, overarching uh, uh, pros and cons of, of both both concepts, and uh, hopefully, kind of represent the, you know, the 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 conversation in a really casual and relaxed and polite way. That's my it's my plan. Excellent. Johan, how about you, sir? Yeah, that's also my plan. Um, my background is I'm a scientist, but from, from uh, younger days, I was also very fascinated by um, spirituality. And actually, I discovered that the science at the university is not real science. Most of the theories are very yeah, based on uh, wrong assumptions. So um, I discovered that there is something like real science. Uh, truthful science and there's also something like truthful spirituality because the spirituality that we find in the religions is also um, not correct it's something it's very biased so what i did is i combined um, sane science and sound spirituality into a wholesome reunion and that i named holy science with w double l and that oh, is wow. where people can find more about it holyscience.org is my website. So with W double L and then science.org. And Johan, that sounds like something we should uh, get into on another show together. Yeah, I think so too, because I also have a lot of uh, research done about Saturn and uh, especially the Saturn cult. So uh, I think we have a lot in common. I but today so. I think we should stick, stick to the subject that we are here for. Absolutely. Now, uh, as far as challenging the mainstream view of things, Watson, what, what does uh, the thing that woke you up to all this? Uh, you know, and again, in the you know, similar to Johan, I kind of come from a science background, and I have a long, rich history of being science oriented. And I would, it's safe to say, I was always somewhat of a materialist, and also a mystic and a spiritualist. And I was always flirting with both uh, 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 an interest in both mysticism and spirituality, and also with science and materialism. So I kind of um, was, uh, I don't know, one of those kind of noetic scientist types. You know the uh, What's that? Uh, what's that show from years ago? Deep inside the uh, rabbit hole, uh, what in the bleep show or that whole series of the you know that uh, Dean Radin was a part of. Like I was, I was one of those mystic scientist kind of guys. So when I I'm coming at this um, at this narrative of this flat Earth thing, you know, basically kind of as uh, with a science oriented, very logical brain, very using very matter of fact. Uh, tenants and stuff and just using logic reason and common sense and in part you know using kind of the you know the scientific method to kind of get a handle on this but 
the way that I came into the Flat Earth Movement was a long, rich history of being involved in the truth community at large or the alternative media community. I've been been you know pretty heavily invested in this uh, since the. 2008, 2009, I think a lot of people can confess to having uh, trigger documentaries like The Zeitgeist and Loose Change at the time and uh, Esoteric Agenda and Chematica during that era um, really kind of jarred me out of my slumber. And to say the least, I got heavily, heavily invested in researching a lot of this uh, un the undercurrents of the alternative media scene with also a long kind of background in the 90s and stuff when I was a when I was younger as an artist and stuff in the 90s, I was I would flirt with Coast to Coast and Art Bell and was somewhat well ver you know somewhat well versed in like w w William Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse and some of the undercurrents of the fringe you know community. But I kind of got distracted with it, got heavily involved in my career and with music and a lot of other things and family and kids, and then I kind of got reintroduced to it. So by the time the spring of last year came up in 2015 i had already been pretty entrenched into you know six seven eight years of pretty deep exposure to a lot of these um a, a lot of these you know uh, fringe topics so I'm, I'm well versed to say the least in a lot of different topics so when the flat earth thing came up i was already kind of geared for it i'd already passed numerous rubicons so to speak and i was kind of like i kind of I saw it with really clear eyes, especially from a perspective that was very guarded and suspicious of the control matrix that's deceived us on innumerable other topics that we could go in at length on, you know, innumerable other shows. So by the time this flat earth came up, it was a very easy step for me to just look at look at the facts and see what the arguments were because I was already in distrust of a system that had lied and deceived us in so many other ways. So that's why when I came into this, in a way, I kind of fell back in love with science because the scientific method, which is, you know, the basic five tenets of the scientific method is to ask questions, make a hypothesis, do an experiment, collect data, draw conclusions, and using empirical observation, which is something that, you know, is, comes from just using your own senses to look out into the world and to speculate and use the scientific method to to harness and reclaim science in a in an honest and sincere and genuine way from like the perspective of a working class layman who's not affiliated with academia or peer reviewed uh, et cetera et cetera I kind of in a way felt this overwhelming sense of joy because I felt alienated from the science community because I wasn't peer reviewed and I didn't go to to study high math and I didn't have access to you know astronomy uh, telescopes and things like that so I'd always felt like it was like a, a lost love or something but now in a way here I am right in the trenches of the 2016 era and the flat earth movement for me is a is is one where I'm able to to use the scientific method and to use empirical observation to get a handle on this conversation so I'm coming at it from that perspective and not from a spiritual or religious perspective at all. Not faith-based, but logic-based. Awesome. Uh, Johan, go ahead and uh, let's, let's hear about you. Yeah, well, when I was studying psychology at the university, I wanted to know what that word means. And psychology literally means the logic of the psyche. But what is then the psyche? And the psyche is actually the soul. But I learned hardly anything about the soul at the university. I only learned things about the mind and about the heart and all the problems that can occur by, by our reasoning or thinking or whatever. And, you know, so what is now really the psyche? And most people confuse it with the spirit. So we have three uh, essential subjects here, the spirit, the soul, and the mind. And, yeah, mainstream science does not know anything to tell us about either the soul nor the spirit. So that's that they say it belongs to the level of metaphysics. And I think that's true. But I think real science from ancient Greece um, was all about metaphysics, much more than about physics. So yeah. uh, since then, I I took all, on, on board, so to say, also that part, alchemy, uh, al uh, alchemistic science and uh, metaphysics, uh, because I think that's very important as well. And yeah, that's, that's uh, how I started, actually. It, I started very young, in my 20s already. Wonderful. Now, going back to you, Watson, uh, what challenged your uh, mainstream worldview to make you lean towards the flat Earth? I think when uh, it, it actually happened, uh, 
uh, for, for uh, amazingly, when I was driving across the flat plains of Canada, which I just recently learned that uh, they, they discovered that Kansas is actually technically more flat than the uh, than actually a pancake. So literally, it's flatter than a pancake. There's some kind of like you know a test they did. So as I'm driving across Kansas, I was listening to uh, to a talk radio. Uh, the Higher Side Chat Show, and uh, which I had already devoured a lot of, you know, years and years of just listening to podcasts, podcasts. I stumbled upon this Flat Earth conversation on this show, and initially I brushed it aside, laughed it away, but I always listen to everything. I'm kind of obsessive about that. I'll devour every topic and every, you know, uh, thing that a, a show might present. And by the end of the show, I was literally screaming out the window in disbelief that, that this topic was compelling and reasonable, and uh, it really blew me away. I, I'll never forget the moment of listening as I'm driving across Kansas, looking out at the flat plains of Kansas. So immediately, I basically went. Uh, I went on a month-long road trip on a tattoo tour across, you know, the Southwest. When I came back home, I focused all my energy into fixating on this topic. And to say that I um, awakened to this or focused my 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 guns into these in, into the trenches. The flight of commu- community is an understatement. I literally devoured every document, every personality, every show, every podcast, every book. It literally completely blew my mind. In part, it was because my love of science and my love of the cosmos, my love of deep space, and my love of of, of the cosmic riddle uh, brought almost. Like, I felt like I was reclaiming that. In, in a way and regrabbing and getting closer to like a Gnostic truth. So I think what really challenged it when I came back, I immediately went up to um, the, one of the first tests, empirical tests that I did is I went up to an observation point in downtown Portland, Maine. Uh, it's an old o- observatory that's been around for a few hundred years. Um, it's like a landmark observatory. I went to the top of it on a clear day and I looked out across uh, the entire state of Maine and into New Hampshire from downtown Portland, Maine, and I could see the entire facade of the presidentials. That, not just the tip of it, but the entire facade. And at that point, I had already learned about that spherical trigonometry has a, uh, an equation where there's an 8-inch drop uh, per mile squared from the distance of the observer, and it was something like 70 miles. This is a general uh, uh, uh uh, points here, but it was uh, roughly 70 miles away, and the uh, the length of the presidential mountains of Mount Washington is 6,000 feet. And using their you know calculations, I should have only been able to see the top third of it. 4,000 feet of this mountain should have been occulted and hidden behind the curvature of the Earth. But on the contrary, I saw the entire facade, not only the entire facade with the Appalachian Mountains receding in both directions, but I could also see Mount Katahdin, which is at equal distance, you know, in a northwest uh, direction. And it it was that moment, that pivotal moment that uh, everything completely fell apart and collapsed. And I became, in part, seriously invested in discovering this flat earth conversation. And I think that's the biggest Achilles heel of the system is that exponentially all over the flat plain, people are observing dis- uh, things at a distance that they should not be able to see on the spherical globe. Cities uh, off in the distance, islands, mountains, uh, light towers. And one of the most amazing thing is if you see a city off in the distance, it's not receding away from you or tilting away from you, which how it would look in a, as, as it curved away. You actually see it perpendicular to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's the the thing for me, what I tell everyone is go look for yourself, especially here in Portland, and observe for yourself, and you can see the entire length of the presidentials. And it's if if you can contain the cognitive dissonance and not fall into the programming and the mind control and the manipulation and the indoctrination that we've been taught that we live on a sphere, then you can look across this beautiful plane at what you actually really see, which is a stunning, flat, stationary terra firma, with a, you know, as the crow flies, the beautiful mountains off in the distance, exactly how they are. That was the moment for me. And from there, the floodgates to open up, an avalanche of more research, and then I immediately, since then, I've flown six times, always flying during the day, always getting a window seat, and every single time, the you know, I, I'd like to talk about that later. But the the next anecdotal empirical observation will be my huge epiphany um, sitting in an iron bird 40,000 feet up in a plane. I'll end there, and we'll come back to that when the time is right. Well, Johan, you're representing the uh, the traditional heliocentric uh, view of the universe. 
what do you have to say about what uh, Watson just threw out, and how do you counter the points that they uh, a lot of the flat Earth people bring up about the mathematics involved? Yeah, well, I didn't do all the mathematics uh, myself, but I have um, yeah six main issues with the flat Earth, and um, um, Watson talked about the scientific method. Well, if you say that there are only white swans, then you need only to show one black swan in order to disprove that claim. And that's that's actually the story for me. If you say the earth is flat, then I found six very hard uh, reasons why it cannot be flat. So f- for me, the, the discussion ends there. But I know there are very strange things going on, absolutely. And I maybe I can explain a few things. For example, what is actually light and why does the sun... Uh, look much closer than it uh, than it officially is. I can explain all that, but but then you have to step first away from a kind of uh, um, paradigm, or I prefer to actually call it a dogma, because we jump to conclusions when we do not understand things, and then we immediately say, well, it is this or that. I think we should have an open mind and put all the evidence on the table, and then uh, have a have a second thought about it, and maybe. There is an, another way of looking at it, or maybe another solution. So I think the the main reason that I uh, I did not enter that discussion is um, yeah because to me it's the answer is really simple. Um, but I've I've encountered many people who are very fanatic in, in the flat Earth uh, assumption, and they are even more annoying to me than Jehovah Witnesses. I can tell you, <laughs> and they are very persistent, and they try to somehow. Yeah, they could become even verbally aggressive to me, and for me, I don't, I don't get that. Yeah, if if I am right, then I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But why do you make such an issue about it? So I think we should just have an open mind. Uh, what I would like to do is I put my um, my evidence on the table, and uh, Watson can can give a reply to that, and he can do the very same, and I will have a reply to that, and maybe then together the three of us can have a kind of. Uh, yeah, uh, s- solution for the moment, or we just uh, call it a draw. That's also a possibility. I think that's the best way to go forward. Just share the scientific evidence that we found, the observations. Absolutely. So, Watson, why don't you go ahead and give the first point that you would like to bring out about why you believe the Earth is flat and what is backing up that point of view for you? Okay, um, it's it's two things, and th- there's a, an, an immensely rich uh, amount of different topics that we could go into, but I always like to kind of keep it as simple as possible with this at at first, and I think the basic question here, the philosophical question is, do we live on a sphere ball? Do we live on a round ball? Do we live in a heliocentric system, or do we live in a a flat plane, a geocentric terra firma system? And the basic question, in essence, is, is it flat? Is it Euclidean geometry? Or is it round? Is it spherical geometry? So what I see when I look out, when I use my five senses and my ability, again, to use the term empirical observation, and when I use that, uh, you know, when I harness my, my logic, reason, and common sense, when I look out across the plane, or when I look out across, at, at, law, at far distances, it appears that I'm looking out over a plane. And the second anecdotal informa- is for me is the first one being seeing long distances, you know, at ground level, at sea level, seeing things that are so far away that you shouldn't be able to see them. They should be hidden around the curvature of the earth. The other one that's amazing, and they, they, they it's uh, to me another Achilles heel of this postmodern era, or I like to say post-historic, because I feel that history is based on monumental lies, so in a way we're in this post-historic era, is that they gift us the ability with a small amount of fiat currency to fly up in one of their iron birds and get the most beautiful perch at 35, 40, 45,000 feet up in an airplane and to look out for yourself again out at the horizon. And what you see is a horizon line that completely ramps up to the eye of the observer and completely goes in a huge 
degree circumference all the way around you and the one thing that will just completely blow your mind is when you look out your window on the left and see the horizon line ramping up to your level and then you are looking out the tiny little fuselage window on the other window you see the same horizon line completely level on the other side of the plane and you connect those three those two points with your observation your singular sentient mystical you know, uh, of empirical observation of pure consciousness sitting there in the plane, you connect your point with those other two data points, those two horizon lines that are roughly 200 miles in each direction. And what do you get? A straight, perfectly straight line. I went to art school. My father was a draftsman. He worked for General Motors. I come from a, 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 a lineage of artisans and draftsmen. I grew up with compasses and rulers and graph paper. All of my artwork, I literally use compasses, rulers, and things like that. I'm a structural illustrator. I work with that type of math, that type of thinking. And when I look out there, and I see that. I connect those three data points. It's like a vanish. It's a horizon line, and you can map it on a piece of paper, and I could illustrate that. with. So in a way, I think, to me, that was the big crushing moment where the house of cards completely fell down. So the essence of my general argument outside of you know, if there's space or if there's a firmament or what the sun and the moon are made of or how far away they are, the basic essence that we need to distill this down to is is it flat or is it curved? And in a spherical uh, a ball beneath us, those that ball should recede off its space, and I should be looking down at a huge ball. And at that horizon level, at that horizon line vanishing point, the 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 horizon of the Earth should be receding down and away from me, and I should not be able to see it through the other fuselage window on the other side. So again, I'm coming to this with just that basic observation point and it to me it it personally for me it's overwhelming proof that i'm looking out at a flat plane and not a ball earth interesting all right how do you feel about that johan yeah well it's uh it's very difficult to get that uh, high up in the air with uh with authentic pictures so i don't i don't know um i've not been that high and i do know that nasa is uh, is lying big time to us it's never a straight answer but i go even further I say it's neither any space adventure either. Uh, because, because, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, yeah, NASA goes up maybe to 400 uh, miles maximum, 300, 400 miles, and that's it. So uh, they've not been further away from the planet ever, at least not with uh, with, with humans on board. Um, so I don't know what to trust. And I, 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 I know it's, it seems like it's very flat. And we also should take into account the way our eyes um, process information. Yeah, maybe if something is curved, our eyes somehow make it straight because actually we don't even know what light is actually. And somehow our eyes are able to process light information and uh, somehow our brain is making an image out of that. And maybe there is something in that process as well. But later on, maybe I can go deeper to that because light is very, it's a very strange phenomenon and the universities do not tell us what light really is. Well, Johan, have you ever traveled just on a, a commercial jet? Of course. Right. I have as well, and I'm not trying to take any sides here. Uh, it looked curved to me. I've flown all over the United States. Um, but I know the immediate counter-argument to that is that the uh, the way the windows are put in, in a commercial liner, that it distorts the field of view. So, And that's probably true just because it has to withstand the pressures. The pressure changes from you know the ground all the way up to <clears throat> however many thousands of feet you are in the air. But... Um, it always looked curved to me, and that's all I really can say about it. Uh, I think yeah. in part that, that might be true with the windows, but one thing that you can't, that doesn't change, is that the horizon line ramps up in a convex way, like you're looking down at a big bowl, and it ramps up and is level with the eye of the observer. That's the anomaly that is uh, is it, that needs to be focused on, is that it's level when you look out the left side and the right side, and if you had access to the cockpit in the front, I guarantee it would be level in that direction. If you had access, if you had a, a vantage point to look in all four directions in a 360 degree uh, perch, um, it would be completely level. And I think it would be at that moment that you would just see a flat plane. But the problem is that you only have this tiny little one little window and one fuselage curved window. I do believe I have noticed now that because of that curved 
fuselage window that it does slightly curve at the edges because of the window but overwhelmingly it's it's pretty level and it's level with your observation on both sides and you can imagine it is on all three sides wrapping 360 degrees around that to me is overwhelming demonstrable proof that it appears to be flat and level the other anomaly that's interesting up in a plane is that you don't see the the earth spinning below you at a thousand miles per hour somehow uh the coriolis effect doesn't uh, affect planes and when you're up there traveling at 500 miles an hour the plane is uh getting pulled along with the gravity of the atmosphere so you don't you know pick up on the fact that the earth is spinning around you you just get carried through this gravity vacuum of 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 uh, of of the of the atmosphere and you don't there's it's not perceptible that the earth is spinning underneath you right uh now johan am i correct in thinking that the centrifugal force of the movement of the planet is why uh humans wouldn't perceive that yeah there are many reasons that might be one of them might be one of them yeah, but to me, it's not it's not really hard evidence so far. It's, it has to do with perception, and uh, maybe there is some trickery going on with our eyes. So I would like to add uh, one of my arguments, and, and I would really love to hear what Watson has to say about that. Okay, go ahead. When I look, I'm, I'm a stargazer. I look at stars a lot. When I'm on the northern hemisphere, and I look at the stars, then I can see that they are going around the star called Polaris in the, uh, the Big Dipper, at the back of the Big Dipper. And they Absolutely. all go around, yeah, they all go around in a clockwise, uh, sorry, in a counterclockwise way, if I'm correct. But on the southern hemisphere, it seems that all the stars go around, yes, yeah, something that is close to the southern cross, that is this constellation that is also in the flag of Australia. And there the stars go around in a clockwise fashion. So it's very strange to me how you can have a flat Earth where on one side the, pl the planets, or sorry, the stars at, at, above your head go around in a clockwise way, and somewhere on the other part of that, some flat pancake, the stars go around in another way. And, and I cannot see, uh, for instance, the stars on the southern hemisphere. I cannot see the southern cross from, uh, from the Netherlands where I'm located. So I cannot see how a flat Earth model is consistent with the uh, movements of the stars. This is a great this is a great point to make, and it's really not one of my um, my strong points when it comes to the anomalies of of, of this of this uh, of this inquiry. I've never been to the southern hemispheres, and I've never I've never seen them spin in a in a contrary direction. My only my first sentiment is that um, it it doesn't seem to be that um, uh, it it might be one of those things similar to the Coriolis effect, where they say that water in a bowl will rotate in one direction in the northern hemisphere and the other direction in the southern hemisphere because of the rotation of the earth. I, it seems like that myth around the Coriolis effect uh, seems to be manufactured and made up and it could doesn't seem to be based in, 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 in demonstrable uh, uh, proof. And it just makes me wonder if that could also be the case with the southern hemisphere region. I do know that 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 star, the the, the supposedly the p pole star of the southern hemisphere, can only actually technically be seen with a very powerful telescope that only maybe the Vatican or the Jesuit order um, has access to, and that it's a hypothetical north pole star. I, uh, the name escapes me what it is, but. Uh, in part because of that, it just makes me wonder if there is actually a rotation like they say there is. I'd have to research more into it, and at this point, um, I'd like to you know, maybe slightly retreat from that particular inquiry. But one of the things I'd like to bring up on that same note when it comes to stars and when we deal with this issue of parallax, which is you know, subtle differences between the, you know, the stars, is that there appears to be on the contrary, when you look up to the North Star Polaris, that it's rotating around uh, uh, in a in a way that's um, that's uh, c completely um, uh, a perfect circle. If you do a time lapse of, of footage with with cameras during a, a, a at, at night, it appears that the entire night sky is rotating over and above and around the North Pole stars. I 
North Pole. Uh, uh, but uh, one thing really quick, I've got this quote here, and I've been really wanting to, to reference it here. But let, let me just say this really quick. And this is one of the things, again, I think that is, to me, could be proof. And if you can imagine that the Earth is spinning around at 1,000 miles an hour, and it's rotating and flying 67,000 miles around the heliocentric sun-centered system, and that when we look out at night, the sun's always hitting us on the day side, but the night side is looking up into the night sky, looking out and away from the night, you know, out and away, you know, in the opposite direction of the sun. When you rotate all the way around the earth at a 180 degrees uh, six months later, how is it possible that you can see the same exact night sky at a dramatically different vantage point um, from in, in that in that time where you rotate around the around the sun, and this really uh, l let me just read this really quick here. NASA and modern astronomy say the Earth is a giant ball tilted back, wobbling and spinning a thousand miles per hour around its central axis, traveling sixty-seven thousand mile per hour circles around the sun, spiraling five hundred mile per hour around the Milky Way, while the entire galaxy rockets a ridiculous 67 million miles per hour through the universe. With all those motions originating from the alleged Big Bang cosmogenic explosion 14 billion years ago, that's a grand total of 67, 670 million 568 thousand miles per hour in several different directions. We're all supposedly speeding along it simultaneously, yet no one has ever seen, felt, hurt, measured, or proven a single one of those motions to exist whatsoever. So when it comes to the night sky, when you look up at, say, the uh, at the at, at the winter solstice on December 21st, um, six months later, when you completely travel all the way around the sun at 180 degree you know vantage point, and you look out again on the on the uh, what is that the the winter solstice on on the on the spring solstice um, that the uh, how is it possible that you can see the same exact night sky with the North Pole directly above us. To me, anomalies like that begs the question if we're actually level and stationary and the sky above us just is rotating above us, just like Occam's razor suggests, that's exactly what we perceive of. Well, I have an interesting thought on that, and uh, <clears throat> I don't want to speak for Johan, of course, but the way I've always understood traditional astrophysics is that Everything, including the Earth, is in this giant celestial dance. So everything is in constant motion, and basic physics shows that, that everything indeed is in constant motion, uh, and it's all related to frequency. But uh, also it's a matter of perspective that the universe is so incredibly vast compared to the tiny Earth in relation to that. But, Johan, why don't you go ahead and uh, let's hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think Watson is not familiar with the difference between a sidereal year and a synodic year. And maybe that's the reason why he's confused. Go ahead and, and, and elaborate on that. Yeah, well, <laughs> the sidereal year is, is uh, or the sidereal cycle, there you take the stars as a point of reference. And uh, that's a different year than, um, than when we take the, um, the, the solstices as a reference. There's a tiny difference, but the tiny difference is just enough to uh, make it completely understandable. So that's why you have, uh, for instance, the daytime on December 21, well, exactly what you were just describing. It's a, it's, it's a well-known phenomena, so you need to understand what is actually a year. What do you, how do you define a year? And if you define it like this, then there is no confusion at all. It's all it all makes sense to me. Does the mathematics behind it all, do they work out? Yeah, they do. It's, it's, there's no problem there, otherwise it would have been uh, already on the table. The only point is that mainstream science talks about gravity as the main force, and I think that's bogus. I think that's nonsense. I think it has to do with electricity and magnetism. You're referencing the electric universe theory? Yeah, that's, that's, that is more reasonable, because then you can also have very quick changes in a, in a short time, like Velikovsky was, uh, was trying to explain. So that makes sense, but, but I, there's nothing wrong with the dates. I've done a lot of research myself, and that makes sense. So 
to me, there's no confusion. Um, I just wanted to mention, too, that I meant to say the summer solstice earlier in relationship to the winter solstice. But I, I totally um, um, kind of understand the general sentiment you're saying. But I, I think the point where I'm coming from as a draftsman and an artisan and somebody who's well-versed in perspective, when I look out at these two vantage points at a six-month difference, I don't see how even remotely possible to see the same night sky when you're looking out at different points into the uh, Milky Way galaxy or into the universe. To me, that is, again, appears to be Occam's razor, which suggests that we're just seeing the same night sky every night and it's not changing or spinning through space at all. Well, my thoughts on that, Watson, is that the Earth in relation to how huge space is supposed to be, and I can't prove if any of this is real, of course, this is just the, the traditional thinking. The Earth is so tiny in relation to these vast distances that, of course, the, the, the minute changes from being on one side of a planet to the other are not going to be anywhere near as perceptible as you as one might think. Uh, and, I, and I totally understand the sentiment, but there would still, I think, be some type of calculable minuscule parallax difference between the stars especially with us i don't see how the night sky can say stay completely static and stay the same over hundreds if not thousands of years i don't think it does actually uh johan do you happen to know this and i, I could have sworn i remember this from middle school astronomy class but hasn't it already been observed that the the stars distances have changed over the, the time that they've been recorded yeah, what, what they uh, do, they work with the Doppler effect and things like that, and then they can come with estimates, but it's all very trickery. But the, the, the general conclusion is that the universe is getting bigger and bigger, and all stars are going away from us. That's the Hubble constant we're referring to, correct? Yeah, exactly. But there are there so many things and assumptions. Actually, we don't even know what light is. And, and my conclusion is <laughs> light is something different than what we think. And if we base... Uh, our measurement of distance on light and the, and the so-called speed of light, it's, it, it's supposedly fixed, but I think that's all not true. So I, I, I can fully uh, go along with Watson if he says that something is very fishy about us. But uh, I we should, completely yeah. agree with that one. I'm completely uh, um, in, in, in agreement that things are very, very unusual and their anomalies run rampant in every, in every persuasion. Yeah. Can I add another one? Absolutely. Yeah, because you can fly three times a week from Sydney in Australia to Santiago in Chile. And um, that would be yeah very far apart on the flat earth uh, uh, diagram or the, uh, the map that I've, saw, I've seen. Yeah, that's similar to the one that is used by the United Nations. I think that's the general map everybody agrees on. But if that map, map is correct, then the Boeing that is flying straight over the USA three times a week goes with a speed that is almost Mach 3 because it's going then 3,200 kilometers an hour. And that is more than 1,000 miles uh, kilometers per hour faster than the Concorde. And actually, it's a normal Boeing. So I don't think it's possible to fly in 12 an hour, half hours in a flat Earth model from Chile to uh, from from Sydney to uh, Santiago. So to me, this is also a second uh, black swan that I present here. Isn't it also true that depending upon which direction you're going, you it will actually take longer to get to your location, even if it's the same distance, and burn more fuel because you have to fight the winds? That's another issue. But the, the, the point is the distance here in a in a globe model, then you come up with a speed of about 800, 900 kilometers an hour. And that's the normal speed for a Boeing. But if you use the flat earth and you then calculate the average speed of flying, then you come up with something that is faster than a military jet. So that is really not possible. So basically what you're saying is that the, uh, the math doesn't work out for the commonly used flat earth model that you should be crossing those distances a lot quicker than you actually are uh, observing. Yeah, Sydney and Santiago must be much closer together than the, the flat earth map that most people are using. So uh, I try to find, of course, the two extremes and then see if it's possible to have a direct flight. And this is actually possible. With Qantas Airlines, you can fly three times a week. And that, to me, is also showing that there is a much closer distance between Sydney and Santiago than the flat earth is suggesting. Right. And, and there could be a, you know, I, I think the truth could be somewhere in between the two arguments, because I'm under the you know suspicion now that even the map that we have 
uh, you know, the, the one that the flat earth map, you know, the flat earth map that the flat earth community generally embraces, which is, you know, in essence, similar to the United Nations occulted hidden flat earth map in plain sight, uh, you know, type of map the azimuthal equidistant map, that that one might be fallacious and wrong, and we might not have something that we can do correct math on. Well, Watson, let's start with um, that map in itself. Where did that originally come from? What the, Since so many people do embrace that, that is the one I see constantly being put out there. What's the basis of that being accepted? It's my favorite map, and... Uh, um, you know, I think overwhelmingly it's one of the, you know, a, a, a pretty powerful map. It was actually illustrated by Alex Gleason in, I don't, I'm not really sure exactly the the year, but in the 1890s. And he wrote a, a, a really powerful book, is, is the Bible from Heaven. And it's got, um, you know, you have to keep in mind a lot of those people during that time, you know, were, were, were uh, you know, using the the Bible in part, but a lot of time, a lot of these people like Alex Gleason were also scientists using, you know, using math too. So half the argument is, you know, is scripture based, and the other half is is uh, science or math based. So that that particular map he did is beautiful, stunning map, and um, you can actually download copies of it. It's all over the place. But yeah, Alex Gleason was the one that did it, and shockingly, amazingly, it's the same exact and similar map that the United Nations uh, have used in their logo. Uh, with the occulted uh, flat earth map that I mentioned hidden within their logo with the the 33 sections of the uh, bullseye target over the front there and a map that um, I recently kind of reclaimed and redesigned and gifted to Eric DeBay for the Flat Earth Research Society and came up with a logo for him that added the extra arrows to suggest that they're possibly hiding more land and I put the you know the transcendental uh, you know, sun and the moon over the top of it to suggest that you know that there was a connection now with this, with the you know the astrology of the of the luminaries above. But yeah, so uh, there's a whole rich tradition of really beautiful, stunning flat Earth artwork and flat Earth cosmology maps and drawings and artwork that go back in every culture for millennia. And one of my favorite hobbies is to dig these things out and find them. I'm actually in the process right now of um, of designing a new map for this new era right now. So I'm. Oh, so apologies on that one. Uh, it's just something to th I would like to throw out there for uh, for both of you to consider. Uh, I've looked at that map, and I also looked up the stereotypical Masonic altar map, and uh, they're very similar. Very, very similar, in fact. And um, I just want everyone to kind of uh, take that in and do that little bit of homework for yourself. Yeah, and we, we don't need to go down that one, but I think that, in essence, if this does prove to be true, I think it's a Masonic hoax that probably goes back 500 years that's rooted in some some high, you know, Jesuit priest order who came up with this insane, brilliant, stunning, alarming concept, and they've seduced us all into thinking we live on a ball so that they could, uh, you know, hide land and hide hide the source from us, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we'll save that for the end of the show. And, Johan, how do you feel about the, uh, the map that's used and just the, the traditional world map being accurate yeah well, you know there is so much disinformation going on so it's very tough to to decide um if something is really helpful or not um so i don't know about the maps and if if there are all the maps i i've studied the work of piri reis he was from turkey and he was he, he made maps that were so yeah so accurate about southern america and about uh, uh the routes and even the the top of antarctica was on his map and that makes sense. So how can somebody in those days have such an accurate map? Maybe people knew more than than we know. Maybe our history is different. That's all possible. But to me, to me, it's it's if you look up from the USA, yeah, especially uh, from from Washington and so on, there you should see if the flat Earth model is correct. You should see three times a week a plane that is going four times as fast going south uh, <laughs> in the direction. And if and if you don't see that. Yeah, three times a week, I, and something else else is going. Yeah, I wish I could see that. That sounds like a fantastic sight. But I think what we have the problem is that all the data is wrong. They've given us false maps, false ball ball maps, false flat flat maps. I don't believe any of the maps. And in, in part, I think the whole things are, are red herrings to a certain extent to use a logical fallacy. And I think that they're taking us down a, a, a garden path here and distracting us with some of these topics, like the the controversy around these flight paths and stuff like that. But I think, again, uh, you know, we can 
we, we could try to debate on that stuff, but it's it's in essence, I think the the uh, the the argument is if it's flat or round, and I think the the crux of this argument should be proving the what it appears to be flat and level, and not what the you know what what type of map it is or whether it's a uh, you know this map or th that map or this way or that way. So again, I like this argument or I like thinking about some of these things, but I always fall back into default mode, which is to me, um, I like to focus on the, the proof, the overwhelming proof that it appears to be flat and seeing, uh, you know, images off at a, uh, seeing mountains and cities off at a distance and seeing the horizon rise to the eye of the observer at 40,000 feet is overwhelming, you know, empirical proof that it appears to be flat. Now, the one thing I think that we all have common ground on here and the reason why we're all here in the first place is because we do question the mainstream uh, viewpoint of things that's been put out by the social engineers of this world. And I, I think that's our common ground is that we're challenging things and we was, we're just truth seekers. And whether our perspectives end up at the end of the day being exactly the same, I think we're all really coming at it from the same point of view is, hey, something doesn't seem right. Would I, would I say that's correct between all of us? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Many things are, are deliberately wrong. So there's no debate about that. Right. And, and that being said, what I'd like to lead into is this whole flat earth, round earth debate is causing a huge amount of friction in uh, the truth movement or the awakening movement, whatever you want to call it um, globally, if you want to forgive me for using that term. But people everywhere, this is causing a lot of rifts, a lot of uh, infighting and Honestly, what it seems like to me is this this is just another distraction that's thrown out there to uh, throw you off the real trail of pursuing truth and trying to get at reality. And um, I'd like to know your thoughts on that, gentlemen. Yeah, I want, but I have some more points I would like to make because um, then, then I, I have it off my chest, so to say, and then well, we can have an open debate. If that's well, good for you. Yeah, let's and go we, ahead and finish the finish the points you have to make in 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 your defense, and then we'll come back to uh, to this topic in a few minutes. Yeah, I just want to put them on the table. We don't have to have a long debate, but then you know Absolutely. at least where I'm stand where I'm standing uh, at, at this moment. Certainly, there is, for instance, yeah, there is for instance a single-handed non-stop sailing race. It's it's uh, every four years, and it it starts in France and it comes back in France too, and it goes around the uh, Antarctica continent. And the sailors are not allowed to go uh, more down than 60 uh, degrees latitude south. So if they go closer, then they take a kind of shortcut in the spherical model. Huh? Of course, I have to say that. But if if it would be on a flat Earth and then you would calculate the distance, they would outrun the most powerful uh, speedboat with their uh, with their sailing boat. So that makes a little bit. Um, I, I cannot see how you can have that. Uh, sailing uh, contest every four years on a flat earth. That doesn't make any sense. So that's the second point, or the, sorry, the third point I want to point in, uh, bring in. And the fourth one is um, if I see a picture from the moon uh, and I compare that with a picture that is taken from the southern hemisphere, then I can see that there's a 90 degree uh, turn of the moon. So actually the face of the moon looks a little bit upside down and that's logical in a spherical model but it's not logical in a flat model and then the fifth one i want to make is the length of the shadows how can you have different length of shadows uh in a flat on a flat plane that doesn't make any sense either and of course on my list is the Coriolis effect because i've seen a scientific experiment uh very precisely done and they do find um, the the different rotation directions, and of course it's also a well-known weather phenomenon. So these are my uh, six points. And yeah, I if if Wasa wants to comment on any of yeah. them, would be I would, good. I would love to comment. Yeah. I would absolutely love that. Those are some great points you made, and some of the some of um some questions that I had early on with this with this uh with this inquiry too. On the note of the sailing um on the thing, um, I think that's a similar question to the distance problem that we have with not really knowing what the correct map is. But would you agree that is um, that you could sail around the ball model as easily as you could sail around a, around a flat spherical model too? Do you yeah, but, see... Yeah. 
that yeah, of the, course, of course, of course, it's possible. But the point is, if the uh, Antarctica is the is the the border of the uh, flat plane, then the distance they have when they go around it, close to that border, that is huge. That's huge. That's that's a oh, hundred thousand kilometers or something. So. Yeah, I think that might be a misconception. They're probably staying very close to the inner latitude lines, and they're kind of hugging the the islands and the and the and the the different continents as they wrap around it. I don't think when they go out into the farthest, like the sixty five latitude line, there where they they're forbidden to go any further because of the uh, Antarctic Treaty and the military that keeps people from going uh, is you know uh, farther than that line to keep people from uh, from Antarctica. I think that mm-hmm. when they wrap around the southern tip of say of of Chile and when they wrap around. Um, say the um, Australia area and the southern tip of Africa. The rest of the time, they're holding really close to those continents, and it's not as uh, it's not like they're traveling sixty-seven thousand miles around the ice wall perimeter. It'd be different. I would love to see if they would allow it is uh, a race around Antarctica, which on the traditional model, I think it's something like twelve to fourteen, or twelve to sixteen thousand miles around that ice rock at the bottom. Where in the flat model, it's more like sixty-five to sixty-seven thousand miles around. So it would be, you know, fantastic if they would just do a race around Antarctica, and then the, uh, you know, the the numbers would be much different. So I, again, I understand the, the general sentiment, but I think it's just uh, it's hard to calculate the math on something like that because we might not have a handle on on what the real geography and what the real maps are. So, but great question. Um, the second one on the note of the moon, when there's a 90, 90 degree turn, when you go into the southern regions, like if you're up in North America or the northern regions and you see the moon in one direction and then the people from Australia and South South America and Southern Africa regions, they're looking up and they see the moon at a 90 degree turn on the on the it works you know well to a certain extent in the heliocentric ball model context and argument but also at the same time if you can imagine putting a an image of a moon in the center on a ceiling in the center of a room where like a, a light would be you tape a a, a a print a xerox copy of the moon to the ceiling and everywhere when you go from one side of the room to the other side it changes a 90 degree orientation so it's a matter of perspective on where you are on the earth on what the moon's going to look like so from a 180 degree difference it's going to have a 90 degree shift in its appearance so again it's one of those arguments that holds up in both the ball model and the flat model and a lot of these arguments um which makes it really challenging is that they're you know they're they're relatively correct in either model that's why a lot of the uh, uh, you know, it's really hard to get a handle on a lot of this, uh, a, 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 a lot of these arguments. On the note of the uh, Coriolis effect, um, or no, you had mentioned the uh, the shadows uh, on on the flat plane. That's a, another crazy notion too. If you think about the 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 sun rays that come down from the sun, especially on a cloudy day, and you see that beautiful break of the sun rays coming down in this fan like effect. Um, I believe that that's more proof that the sun is considerably much more closer at, say, 3,000 miles above the surface of the Earth instead of 93 million miles away. Because if the sun was that far away and it was as large as they say it is and as tiny as we are, we would be blasted with sunlight that would be coming all with the same parallel direction. So all the sunlight coming through the clouds would have the same vertical orientation and we would not see them sprayed out you know, like a, like a, like a Illuminati pyramid is, which is one of the reasons, one of the things I think that they occult in that Illuminati pyramid with the all seeing eye is that the sun up there or, you know, radiating down in its stereotropic, you know, relationship to the earth. Um, so again, it's one of those things that's, that's tricky. Um, but what I see, uh, you know, using my observation and especially my rich history as a draftsman and using one point, two point and three point perspective, when I look up at the sun and I see a singular light ray coming out, I don't see light rays. I see, I see lines of data. And when I connect those to a point, if I was to have a sextant, a traditional sextant, and would do the, you know, do the do, do the math and the calculations on that, 
Um, you know, I, I, I guarantee just like a lot of astronomers and mathematicians have been doing for centuries, you know, if not millennia, that the sun appears to be very, very close to the surface of the Earth and might actually be only be 32 miles, 33 miles across and only about 3,000 miles above. So again, depending on what model you're looking at, um, uh, brings dramatically different, you know, um, uh, answers. On the note of the Coriolis effect, this is another one of those uh, um, very curious things. What what I find frustrating about it, and I understand the idea of it with uh, with weather systems and with uh, and with with um, things like um, you know uh, folk arts pendulum and things like that. But one the, the the big anomaly for me or the big smoking gun about this is that they always argue about how the Coriolis effect has to, uh, snipers have to take in the Coriolis effect when they shoot rounds across long distances. And if that's the case, why aren't we also calculating the Coriolis effect for airplanes and flying objects and helicopters, especially airplanes landing on, on runways and stuff? You think that the Coriolis effect, if it actually affects a bullet which travels much faster than a plane, you would think that the Coriolis effect would also affect pilots and why aren't they calculating that as they're riding flying down and landing on runways there'd be things like if the Coriolis effect really existed there would be it would be almost impossible to land jumbo jets on runways without disastrous accidents well if, uh, correct me if i'm wrong i think that um, pilots do make minor course corrections throughout the course of a especially a long journey in relationship to the Coriolis effect? Well, just in general, that um, while they have flight patterns already pre-mapped out, I do believe that they have to make minor adjustments due to several variables. Yeah, if they, they probably do have to do minor adjustments, but if they were actually curving around a ball, traveling at 500 miles per hour, and with the circular trigonometry or the circular distance that they give us of the Earth being 25,000 miles in diameter, they would have to make very dramatic shifts pointing the nose of the airplane down to compensate for that curvature at such a speed and um, on the contrary if you talk to pilots or if there's some of these some pilots that have come out and spoke about this and I've also spoke with pilots when I do fly I ask them if they have ever if they have to adjust the 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 their plane or if they just get to a certain level and just sit back and let the planes automatically um, autopilot and they just sit back and watch the gauges as they stay completely level with the plane of, of the earth. So again, these are great questions, uh, but from my observation and my general study, um, it appears that the Coriolis effect might just be a, a, a fanciful myth. Johan, I'd love to hear some more on this because um, this sounds like something that I- could be taken need to be taken into effect, but I, I'd love to know uh, some more scientific background on on the phenomena. And there are two boys. One is in the UK, and the other one is in Australia. And they did the very exact experiment. You can find it on YouTube. And they are, they also have a kind of humor, very good sense of humor. So the guy in Australia puts the picture on YouTube upside down, so that you believe that he's on the <laughs> upside down world. But anyway, they did it very controlled. They had a bathtub and a very small um, twist under underneath uh, to to open it, so there were no disturbing factors. And they did it, and they showed it by putting colors into the water, and then you can clearly see. There is a counterclockwise movement on the northern hemisphere in the UK, and there was a clockwise movement for the guy who did it in Australia. And those YouTube videos, they relate to each other. If you want, I can uh, can look well, them up. Could, and I can... There could be an electromagnetic effect happening to talk about the electric universe. Um, why does this have to be because of the spin of the Earth? I think it might be we could be in a torsion energy field and there could be an electromagnetic, um, you know, Taurus energy system that's running the whole show. And that those type of forces could be causing um, uh, subtle effects of, of water rotating in opposite directions. But what's so troubling about that, um, tr- uh, that, that thought or that, that using that proof as proof of the Coriolis effect is that it still doesn't deal with the effect that snipers have to calculate Coriolis effect when they shoot people at a distance or they shoot targets at a distance, but planes don't have to ever calculate the Coriolis effect at all. So why is there a double standard with snipers and with drainage uh, water rolling down drains, but not with 
huge jumbo jets with hundreds of thousands of millions of people flying every year that could put their lives in danger. It's not even brought up. It's not even taught. It's only taught to snipers. Yeah, I don't know that uh, Watson, but but um, I can imagine a little bit because yeah, you have to be very precise, and a bullet I think is more uh, easy um, uh, influenced by winds than than a big plane. But maybe that's not true either. But I'm not a sniper. I've not done a sniper school, so I don't know. But right. uh, I, I I know this I know this experiment. If you want, I can uh, send the videos afterwards and uh, you can put the links there. Yeah, and to me that's a really good uh, thing. But also all the weathermen's weather people, how do you call them, forecasters, whatever they they work with the weather, they know this uh, this too. And in the flat Earth, yeah, then you have to make a circle. You have an inner circle, which is then the northern hemisphere, and an outer part of that circle, the the the, the outer ring, so to say, uh, is then the southern hemisphere. And it's yeah, you cannot explain why that effect suddenly changes when you cross that circle because in the flat plane. Uh, well, that's, that circle is, has no let, meaning, but in the in the sphere it has a meaning because it goes. Say, with, yeah. Let's run with this idea that the electromagnetism, that the electric universe is uh, is going to be proven to be correct more over more so than gravity, um, or what's been speculated with Newton through Kepler and Einstein and all the astrophysics of this modern era is that if it's electromagnetism and the sun and the moon are oscillating in a corkscrew relationship back and forth between the Tropic of Capricorn in the southern regions and around and then spiraling upwards six months later to the Tropic of Cancer in the summer regions, they pass by the equatorial equator, which is the middle point between the two tropics. If this is, if this is an electromagnetic universe, then maybe whatever is the mechanisms that, again, hypothetically speaking from a flat model orientation, is that from uh, from that perspective, what might actually be fueling and running and the mechanics around this, the sun and the moon and all the, the, the planets or the, the planet star luminaries and all the stars above might be some kind of electromagnetic metaphysical transcendental um, science that we have absolutely no comprehension of is that and in that middle point, that equatorial region between the two tropics, there could be an energy shift uh, that's uh, in you know that that normal modern instruments cannot perceive of or or calculate, and there could be some effect with that with a with with the relationship to that idea of it being electric universe an electromagnetic system that's actually uh, fueling and running um, you know the stars above, causing the shifts in in uh, rotation, causing the shifts in, in in temperature, causing the shifts in weather clouds and weather fronts so i don't know again i'm speculating about this i don't know i'm just looking at from what i've been exposed to and trying to get a handle on this from a layman's perspective but to me that seems more reasonable than um than the heliocentric model that they've given us um and it uh, there seems to be a uh, the electric the electric universe uh, really holds well in a system in a potentially closed system slash infinite plane system like a flat plane geometry that appears to be what we're living in. Uh, just a scientific thought here. Would entropy not exist in a closed system if it was a 100% closed environment? That's a great question. Um, if entropy does exist in a closed system, uh, you know, I, I think that entropy does exist because, um, you know, life rises and falls and we were born and we die and, uh, and you can see this. You can see entropy in every form of life. You can see it with the passing of the seasons. You can see it with the passing of age. You can see it with everything. So I don't see why you know, why entropy would not also exist, uh, and the and the cycles of life and the rhythms of life uh, would also exist in a in a in a. Uh, I don't like to use the word closed system, but the uh, you know the flat plane uh, model over the uh, over the circular deep space model. I don't believe it's a closed system. I think it's an infinite plane, and I can get into the metaphysics of that from my study with astral projection and Robert Monroe's research at the Monroe Institute of Applied Sciences and some of the stuff I was involved with in the 90s. But I'm coming at this from a from a metaphysical perspective. So I'm when I when I look out at this plane, I see uh, um, I see the same geometry that I see on the astral plane when I used to rise up out of my body during hundreds 
of astral projections that were you know inspired during those during that or those early years and a lot of that early exploration i always rose up out of my body into an astral plane it was always a flat euclidean plane that i traveled over and across so if you think of the hermetic adage of as above so below it makes sense to me that the material realm would also be plain geometry it's the same exact uh, geometry as the other spiritual realms the higher realms and that the material realm is actually a flat plane geometry just like the higher dimensional realms are this might be based on flat plane geometry opposed to you know all the other arguments they have for uh like say uh i don't know some of that what appears to be some of the nonsense between you know around like the space time theories and outer space deep space relativity gravity the heliocentrism big bang NASA nonsense that appears to be completely crumbling on its own footprint at close scrutiny. So I'm turning into what appears to be kind of like a transcendental scientist or a metaphysical scientist or, uh, you know, a science mind that's a, that's also a mystic and a spiritualist. So I'm kind of merging all fronts into some unified grand theory to use their vernacular. <laughs> but instead of it being the four forces coming together to try to find this grand unified theory, it might be um, it might be true metaphysic, you know, metaphysical science, or as uh, Johan calls holy science, which is, you know, science and subtle energy merging together into one unified front. I think that's the future of science and where humanity is going, and what part of this great awakening is is merging the mystic with the with the with with logic. I think that's definitely the way we should be going as far as trying to analyze the true nature of the universe. But Johan, how do you feel about entropy, uh, the second law of ther thermodynamics? And um, Watson threw a lot out there. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't like the word entropy too much because entropy is only true in a dead world. And in the living world, it's neck entropy. Actually, neck entropy is the, is the blueprint or, or actually the, the sign that there is life. What we are producing in this world is actually negative entropy. So uh, I, I think that whole idea is upside down and I don't believe any law there of conversation, only within closed systems and only with dead material. But we conscious beings, uh, we are able to create out of nothing uh, with, with, with energies that are not in the textbook, energies that are beyond uh, the, the physical energies and they are much more important. We know all about this every morning we wake up and we have a lot of energy and at a certain moment we get really tired and then energy is gone. But that energy cannot be measured. It's not has to do with the amount of uh, what we've eaten. Yeah, if you have, if you're very hungry and suddenly you see a very powerful speech, then you are filled with energy again. Where did it come from? So uh, I don't focus too much on that old fashioned physics because to me that's not really helpful. No, that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Gentlemen, would you say you hit on the uh, salient points you wanted to make as far as scientific evidence to back up your worldview? Yeah, um, there's so many other things I could have uh, brought up and a lot of other things. But again, I think my basic you know, uh, thing to, to keep this concise and to the point is that it appears that you can prove to yourself that it appears to be level and flat and motionless. And to me, that's um, that's kind of where I, I'd like to end my general arguments and people out, you know, in the listening audience can research for themselves and you could go down an immensely convoluted uh, uh, path in myriad directions researching every topic of this and I advise that you do and I definitely have, have, have done that myself and I could also go into a lot of different directions but for the, you know, in the spirit of brevity, um, I, I think that I just made my general sentiment that I'm actually... Uh, you know, just suggesting that it appears to be flat and not round and uh, using my uh, abilities to do that myself have proven it on a personal level that that's what I've, I've discovered. And how about you, Johan? Do you have any other points you want to uh, address? Yeah, I think, I think the, the main problem here, I think I made already all my points, so I don't have anything to put on the table, but I think we, we jumped to conclusions. It's just like I would ask the two of you, is it Hillary or is it Donald? <laughs> yeah, because that's not really the, the question. The question is not which model is right. I think we should put all the anomalies on the table. And then from there on, we should uh, somehow find a solution that fits all the phenomena that we see. And the problem that I have with the flat earth um, uh, theory is that it, in my opinion, jumps to a conclusion. There are so many anomalies and therefore the earth must be flat. That to me is not 
sound way of reasoning. And that's why I, uh, yeah, to me it, it blocked and uh, somehow the door closed and I could not, uh, could not um, put myself to watch any more videos about it because it's not really helpful. So, um, so I think uh, Watson, Watson, I can make can maybe uh, create a bridge through this uh, uh, radio broadcast, um, so that we can help the the communities that are there now and they are struggling big time, in my yeah. opinion, that we somehow help uh, that conflict to end because it's not about who is right; it's about in what world are we really living in? What is really going on? We have been lied big time yeah. by. By the governments, by the by NASA, by 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 the universities, um, but we should not fight each other. It, it, maybe you've seen the film um, uh, from Monty Python. It's called Life of Brian. Mm -hmm. It's yes. a very very funny film where the people who want to fight the Romans are actually fighting each other. So they <laughs> totally forget that the Romans were the were the bad guys, and not the, but but they are so so focused on fighting each other that they don't do it. Yeah, the flat earth people and the, and the globe earth people, or how you want to call them, they both know that NASA is lying. So why don't we join instead of fighting each other? I think that's very silly what we're doing. I completely agree with that. And uh, I'd actually like to really jump into that. What are your thoughts? Uh, let's start with you on this, Johan, since you brought it up on NASA, what they're lying to us about and why are they doing it? NASA has to lie about it because they started lying in 1969 when they broadcast a landing which was not on the f surface of the moon Luna, but was at a studio, I think somewhere in England, but it doesn't really matter where it is. It was most certainly not beyond the Van Allen belt because NASA did not know anything about the Van Allen belt. So uh, they had no measures to, to protect the astronauts and the plane against that radiation. So NASA is lying from 1969 on. Then at a certain moment, they stop with the lunar missions, manned man lunar missions, for some very unclear reason. They say they will start, I think, 2018 again, something like that. But ever since, NASA is lying. The Hubble telescope is within the magnetic sphere of our planet. So it's not that far away. And I distrust every image that comes from NASA um, because NASA knows that the universe is different than the um, than the models that we have learned, and that's why they they have to continue this lie. But I I'm 100% certain that the Russians were very laugh, laughing very hard when they saw that fake lunar landing in 1969 because it is technically impossible with the Apollo technology to go there and to come back. It's not possible. I completely agree with you, Johan. I'm 100% convinced that we that we never went to the moon. I've done all the research. I've been studying that for years. Some of you know, like without referencing all the you know exciting research around that that everybody's probably generally familiar with, we can completely 100% agree that NASA is completely full of fakery, shenanigans, deception, and but I would take it one step further and say that. I don't believe anything that NASA has ever done. I don't believe in satellites. I don't believe in the Hubble Space Telescope. I think the International Space Station is a fakery. If you use the same critical analysis that you do when you dig into the fake Apollo missions and see the monstrous amount of deception, anomalies, and problems with uh, of, of critiquing and digging into that narrative, you can have the same critical analysis on satellites, on the International Space Station, on Hubble Space and also uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and also on this ridiculous notion that we actually landed rovers on Mars and that there's deep space voyage satellites you know that just passed Pluto and all that stuff I remember back when I used to be jokingly called uh, you know quote a baller in the 2012 era I used to listen to coast to coast uh, voraciously and it was at the time that um, that the the curiosity mission was landed on Mars and you know being my general space guy and into space everything I was following that story like a hound and I devoured everything I was showing people all the cool, cool footage and I was actually listening to Coast to Coast at the time when they supposedly landed that ill-fated fake hoax on that ill-fated fake luminary and I've come to believe that um, everything NASA says is a lie so my question to you Johan is why would an organization that's so insidious and diabolical that would do such a monstrous 
hoax and scam on the world population, why do they have any credibility or credence to believe that anything that they've done since then is true? And how could you not critically wonder why a, an uh, 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 organization of deception like that won't, wouldn't also maybe be the same people behind all kinds of deception and false flags and manipulations and possibly maybe even a 500-year-old high Masonic Jesuit order deception of a fake heliocentric model. I guess the general sentiment is that how can you believe in uh, or c critically look at NASA, but not be suspicious of the entire organization and everything they've ever represented in any groups like the Freemasons that have ever been affiliated or associated with them. And yeah, that, that to me goes too far. I, a friend of mine is working with satellites and he's doing telecommunication and he, he operates them and, and they know exactly where they are and they uh, have a lot of uh, very advanced software to make make that all happen, and there is telecommunication possible via the satellite. So I don't I don't uh, have any reason to say that, that that they are not there. And there are people who are going to, yeah. In the Netherlands, there are two astronauts that became really famous because they also went to a, a space station. Uh, yeah, actually, it's not real space station. I dislike that word very much. If you look up what the name NASA means, it says arrow. In the word arrow, yeah, it's it's uh, so they it's it's an arrow station, not a space station. They're still up in the air. It's high high up in the air, with an airplane you go up to about ten kilometers, um, and with an uh, with, with with those uh, arrow advanced arrow planes of NASA, you go up to 400, 500 kilometers, six hundred maximum. But that's it. They don't they don't go really into space. It's still the Earth atmosphere they're all in. So that is that's that's. that's yeah, yeah. Look up what the name is. It's uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It's aeronautics. It's not astronautics. It's aeronautics. They're very clear about it. Well, I just real. I just made that connection with the word arrow as a symbolic uh, um, form of the vector symbol that they use in all their logos. On that NASA symbol, it has that vector symbol, which also looks like an arrow. So aeronautics or arrow. You know. So again, I think it might be that occulted vector symbol. Again, we can agree to disagree on that one. I, what I see when I look at the footage and me being a visual artist and I'm looking at the International Space Station, I'm looking at the video footage of the International Space Station from, of Earth, I never see any video uh, 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 proof of any satellites. And the one thing that blows me away is if satellites are traveling at 18, 17 to 18,000 miles per hour, around the earth and there's up to you know 15 to 25,000 of these spinning all at once why don't one we never hear of any crashes we never see explosions up in the sky like we could we would see um, you know if they crashed into each other and two you think there would be a whole culture and a whole subgenre of photography of photographers mounting GoPro cameras and really high-end cameras on top of their friends satellites and paying them a few thousand dollars a month to do that so they could have access to the earth and take beautiful photographs and stunning photographs there'd be tabletop books of the earth from the vantage point of famous um, uh, photographer satellites, you know, like if I was a photographer and I had the money, um, I would put a camera on a satellite. I know they'll probably say they can't do it because it's, you know, uh, you know, for military issues or reconnaissance or for um, for security or homeland security. But still, you know, you'd think there would be some video footage or some type of amazing video footage of this whole ocean of busy, bustling rush hour traffic of these 20,000 satellites spinning around at some maddening pace, but you don't see one video ever, one photo. I've never seen a video or a photo that's not a CGI fakery. So to me that begs the question, is this part of the is this part of the trickery? Is this part of the mind control? Is this part of the indoctrination? Is this part of the scam? And also all the photos, if you said that you don't believe or trust any of the photos from the Hubble t Space Telescope, then why do you even think that there's one up there? Yeah, well, it's difficult to make those pictures with that kind of resolution. So, but but yeah, of course you can question anything. I've I've not been uh, near the telescope, the Hubble telescope. I've not been in the International Space Station. I've not been in a space shuttle or, or an aero shuttle. Uh, 
So I don't know all that, but but yeah, you have to draw a like line. To, in my, I would like yeah. you to see. Um, I, it would be fun to maybe um, connect your friend with Jason, and maybe Jason could have a, a, a you know a little interview with him about. Um, his connection to being able to, um, you know, have this technology to, to manipulate and control and be in direct uh, contact with a satellite that's up there is because uh, I've I, I would love to pursue that lead and see if how you know well, what that person thinks about this about this insane controversy on whether satellites exist or not. Well, let's talk about satellites for a minute, Johan. What would you say would be the direct evidence that there really are satellites in space? Uh, well, uh, they, there is a lot of um, money going on, um, not only for spying, but also for telecommunications. And, uh, for instance, we can now connect with each other through, uh, I think, through a satellite. I don't think it's going through a cable under the uh, Atlantic Ocean. But actually, I don't really know how we are talking right now. But but it's so we are so used to using satellites for, for GPS and all those technologies. Uh, I have no reason to doubt it. I think that the overwhelming proof that satellites do not exist is the uh, stunning amount of. I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm assuming I stepped in there right at the right time. Did I interrupt you, Johan? No, I don't. I don't have any. Okay. Um, okay. Any point, well, points to make. One of the things, the big elephant in the room with this topic, is that there's. Uh, there's a, a an epidemic, a virus of cell phone tower masks that are destroying our landscape and flooding us with a resonance frequency that's interrupting the resonance frequency and the human residents of the of the Earth itself of Gaia. And there's this like millions of these cell phone tower masks that are put all over this flat plain. Those things are being used to triangulate GPS and for cell uh, and for cell phones, which again, there's an epidemic of cell phones too. There's millions, if not billions, of them out there. They trojan horse the NSA into the control system. They've got every motherfucker carrying around one of these cell phones. And you think those cell phones are communicating with satellites up there when they have millions of these cell phone tower masks, you know, peppering our landscape like a, you know, like a like a, a ugly tree in the sky. And then on top of that, I think it's, some, it's something as high as 90 to 95 percent of all of the world's communications are in fiber optic, fiber optic, fiber optic cables that are put under the seabeds and connecting all of the countries and all the world powers together so that this fucking, I don't, I don't mean to cuss, so that the internet can run all its communications. So we have a huge industry of, of uh, fiber optic co- cables crisscrossing all the oceans and then this incredible epidemic of cell phone tower masks all for GPS and cell phones. Why would they even need satellites? No, I thought satellites were doing all this communication. Aren't our phones going up to a satellite, to a communication satellite? What's the point of even having satellites? No, I, could, I can tell you that cell phones work off of towers. Uh, that I do know. Absolutely they do. Look what happens in part when you go into dead zones, when you're traveling, when you go into less populated areas, or when you go hiking the Appalachian Mountain Range and you go into areas where there's no cell phone tower masks. Why do you get slightly get a reception when you go up onto a summit of a mountain on a on a path way out in the wilderness, but if you go on to, into a valley, you you know you go into a dead zone. If there were satellites that we were communicating with, there would not be one spot on this rotating global earth that you could go that a satellite wouldn't reach and you would have great reception anywhere and everywhere valley deep mountain high but that's not the case it's all ground-based cell phone well, triangulation there, there are sat phones that it's, it's very well known that there are sat phones and mobile devices don't claim to use satellites they are the reason why they call them cells is because everything that a mobile phone uses is broken up into a cell, and if you get outside a particular cell, that's why you, you would have a diminished signal. I can honestly say that I don't think that's an argument for whether satellites do or don't exist. Uh, I also know people who had phones, and I'm old enough that I remember sat phones being the only thing you could get in the 80s. Uh, my father had one, for instance, uh, for his job. So I don't think that's necessarily conclusive evidence, and uh, Johan, I don't know if you'd like to contribute to that. Yeah, we have in the Netherlands many immigrants from Morocco and Turkey, and they don't like the television that they get from the cable, so they all buy a satellite disc and put it on the balcony and, and aim it at a satellite, and they have to aim it correctly in order to get a signal. So they're aiming at something up in the sky, and I don't think that's a huge tower. So to me, that's also a clue that there is something that's giving them 
a signal which they can uh, then use to watch their own television program in their own language. Uh, I also remember those from the 80s, too. Uh, my friend, my father had several friends who had the... And back in those days, it wasn't like the small little direct TV ones we have nowadays. They were like giant things that looked like something out of NASA, and uh, you would, indeed would pick up things from other countries with it. Mm-hmm. But maybe we can, can uh, come to a kind of um, you know, synergy. I think uh, Watson made his points. I made my points. Um, I still think think we jump to conclusion but there is something something fishy so um maybe we can use use this uh this program to to reach out to each other because yeah um, I, I think there's too much tension now and uh people get really upset i was in denmark for the open mind conference i was there last year too and i already got a question from a very fanatic flat earther and this year he was <laughs> trying to yeah talk to me again but he came became very abusive and i don't think it's good because he's a really nice guy but the moment he sees that I don't agree with him, he becomes angry and, and starts to call me all kinds of names. And I don't see why we should do that. I agree with you completely there. I, th- I keep seeing this being repeated. And it's actually why I wanted to do this program was so that it could be discussed in a format that does not turn into a whole bunch of aggression from either side. And I, I look at a lot of forums. I listen to a lot of talk radio and I'm friends with different truth researchers all over the world. Um, actual big shout out to Mark Devlin for actually helping me to arrange this show because he knew both of you, uh, just to use him as an example. Mark's amazing. He's a great guy. And thank you, Mark. Mm-hmm. But that's my whole point is that um, I do speak to a lot of people all over the world who are all challenging the mainstream point of view like we are all doing. But when it comes to this flat earth round earth thing, all of a sudden there's this huge wall that gets struck and causes a whole lot of tension. And I think this needs to be dealt with in a, in a very different way. I think laughter, joy, compassion, love should be used. I hang out with and I research a lot of researchers that are not flat earthers. I've actually, some of my favorite researchers uh, 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 have you know publicly dismissed it or don't want anything to do with it. And I still listen. I still follow their material. Um, and I still find them to be genuine. I think it's one of those topics that um, that is... Um, I, at least from my perspective, it, I don't judge somebody if they're not behind this or not. I think it's the most fascinating thing that's ever happened to me. And maybe because I've always been such a space guy, um, I just grabbed onto it like like wildfire because all of a sudden I have this beautiful handle on what appears to be this beautiful, stunning, flat, terra firma, infinite plane cosmology. And it's blown my mind and it's influenced my artwork. I'm making artwork. I'm doing paintings, doing drawings, illustrations. I'm coming up with sigils. Everything I'm all the artwork I'm making is, you know, is inspired by this narrative. Well, at the same time, uh, it's not my main identity. I'm focusing on all these other topics. I'm researching all these other things, and I'm, I'm still loyal to all these other researchers. So I think if I was to give advice to people out there is that to just lighten the fuck up and relax a little bit, whether you're whatever model that you align with, I think we can casually have a conversation. We can agree to disagree and Johan and I have similarities that, you know, about I'm really curious about his holy science and the metaphysics and transcendental narrative and things around that that him and I can connect with. And we don't have to focus on this flatter thing. If I ran into Johan at the, at the uh, Open Mind conference there, you know, I, I'd totally hang out with them and we connect on all these other issues. A lot of the researchers and friends that I have, if they don't want to talk about it, I don't talk about it. I hung out with, uh, with, uh, with, with, again, I don't really want to name drop, but I've hung out with quite a few people and I'm connected with, with a few. And if they, if they don't want to bring it up, then I just simply don't. So I don't judge people. I'm really relaxed. And I think the general sentiment is to just to have love and compassion for people in whatever way that they might be in their, in their path. And if they don't want to talk about this or if this just challenges too many paradigms and it's a little bit too 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 heavy to 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 deal with then then sidestep it and talk about other things that you're connected to or that you're kindred with so and johan how do you feel about all this um since you do go to a lot of conferences and speak at them and interact with a lot of people in different countries how are you seeing the whole movement of uh flat earth versus round earth translating over to everyone it seems to me like the old good old i would say divide and conquer strategy because now the truth movement is divided just like we had the the 9-11 also the non-plane and the uh, and the plane group 
So that, that's not really helpful. We both know something is wrong. Uh, and instead of helping each other to find the truth, we start to attack the other group because they don't believe what we believe. And, and, and to me, that's not really useful. And what's also a little bit disturbing to me, I'm now very into the end times prophecies of the Bible. And uh, I don't want to scare the two of you, but the times are coming really close. And I think the USA will be a, a major player in what is going to happen very soon. So um, instead of focusing on is it a is it a flat plane or is it a sphere? I think we are about to enter a third world war, according to the prophecy of Daniel, if it's all true. Because I know that the people who try to run the show on this planet, they take this prophecy very literal and they want to make it come true. And if they get their way, then nobody is worrying anymore whether it's flat or a sphere because we're all in deep shit. Well, I completely I, agree uh, with that. I, I uh, agree with that. <laughs> it, it, it's... It's almost like we're being distracted as a whole away from what I would say are much more important issues. And I think we're all in agreement on that, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, of course. Of course, I have to make time free for this because my main focus is now to to show what is really there in the Bible because the words that we have in English, they are not always correct. And I go back now to, to the original Greek version and then I see that some verses are completely mistranslated. And if you correct it, it starts to make a lot of more sense. And then it becomes really important to know what is written down because I think the people from the past, they really had visions. I know Watson has, has his journeys, he said, astral journeys, but those people, they saw something coming to us that is so big that they had to write it down. And if they are right, then, yeah, it's a, it's a real uh, changer of, of the whole of reality. And what language are you translating that from? From Greek, but I didn't have Greek at school, so I, I use Internet to do it word by word. It takes a lot of time, but there are some good translations. But if you, for instance, take the King, King James Version, there's so many errors there. It's actually, yeah, it's a disgrace, to be honest. That doesn't surprise me at all, to be honest with you. No, and uh, and of course there's a reason too. We talked about the lies of NASA, but uh, yeah, we can also talk about the Jesuits and uh, and and uh, the the the, pap uh, the papal uh, uh, yeah criminal organization, if I can call it like that. Yeah. So uh, re religion is used to mind control people big time as well, and um, and especially in the USA, there's so many people who call themselves Christians, but they have no idea that Christianity has been has been perverted by the, the Roman Catholic uh, uh, organization. So true Christianity has nothing to do with, with most things in the Bible. You need to have the original um, writings from the apostles and, and the prophets from the ancient times, and then you can make some more sense out of it. So that's what I'm focusing on right now, and it takes me all my time to be... Uh, Honest. Yeah, absolutely, and I think some of those uh, some of those ancient scriptures are, are riddled with all kinds of Gnostic truth, and I think one of the things that I resonate with, um, outside of everything that you just spoke of, is that a lot of the ancient scriptures appear to be um, also as an undercurrent, you know, very sympathetic to this, uh, you know, to a, to the flat Earth cosmogony. But on a on a on a, another note, when it comes to uh, uh, um, resonating with um, or, or trying to deal with this this topic about this uh, uh, flyer thing in the truth community at large, one of the things that I've always done is I'm a generalist with my research. I'm the same way with artwork. I like to get I like to get involved over the years. I've fiddled with every type of medium you can imagine. And I'm well versed in almost any type of uh, artwork that deals with any discipline or any medium. And on the same note, when it comes to my research over the years and the type of topics I'm interested in, I'm a generalist. I grab a, I study and focus in on almost every topic imaginable and get a little bit of handle on it, and then I move on to the next topic. So for the me, I think the flatter thing should be something that everybody should at least spend a, a little bit of time with, and then move on to you know other passions or other interests. I've actually had a really difficult time because I've been really heavily invested in uh, digging and researching into what appears to be an enormous psyop connected to uh, in the same train of thoughts from, uh, you know, from Mark Devlin and musical uh, uh, Truth and Dave McGowan's uh, uh, Weird Tales from the Canyon all the way up into this new research that Jan Irving and Joe Atwell are doing with the dark occulted underbelly of the Burning Man Festival. And me being, you know, kind of a uh, renegade uh, 
misfit, radical, rebel rouser, mischief brewer, paradigm smasher, bohemian, uh, sympathetic on the fringes of this culture. I've always been connected, and, you know, in, clo- in, in close proximity to a lot of the Burning uh, Man community, a lot of the uh, Bohemian New Age community, and to think that there's some uh, some darker undercurrents to that. So the general sentiment, though, is I'm researching a lot of different things, and I'm all over the place. And I think that for me, that's a that's a good way for me to get a handle on this big picture. So when guys like you know, Johan, who I can tell has a big heart and he's super genuine and serious when he's focusing his uh, his interest on translating the ancient scriptures. I'm all ears. I'm totally into it. It doesn't matter what, you know, all, all researchers have something to say and they've got something to bring to the table. So in the defense of the Flat Earth Movement, I think it's something that everybody should put some time into and either realize that it's completely flat and level and stationary like I have, or they can get on the philosophical fence and stay neutral, which I think is a, an impressive perch to be, or they can, you know, r- r- remain and, and hold on to the heliocentric model. But it doesn't matter what somebody's p- opinion is in one of those three camps. All that matters is that we should stay together as a united front because we do have some really dark uh, uh, dark forces at play here that are manipulating us. And I don't think, I personally think that this Flat Earth movement was a natural awakening. I don't think it was a psyop. I don't think it was put there, there to, to divide us. I think it's just another riddle in this big puzzle. And when you, the, the biggest psyop of all is to realize they've lied to us about this. And if they can lie to us about the ground we're standing on then these guys can lie to us and have lied to us about almost every other thing in the human experience so all of a sudden you suspiciously will start looking at everything from 9-11 to the false flags sandy hook boston bombing orlando shootings transhumanism you know gmos uh geoengineering go down the list of all these heavy topics and everything is under close scrutiny so one of the intellectual exercises that this gave me was to critically look at the data and to see for myself whether uh, i could see that it was flat or round and to me it's overwhelmingly flat and then i'm honestly i have i had a really hard time getting ready for the show because i have not been focused on this flat earth research for a few months i've kind of I'm um, already done, uh, already passed that Rubicon and I was galloping past it and kind of, you know, um, headlong into the trenches of a lot of other research. So um, to me, it's one of those things you take in briefly and you uh, and uh, come to terms with it and whatever dark night of the soul you're going to have. And then you move on to other research and all of us should be united as a collective resistance of sentient light beings that are coming together as a truth and alt community as a united front against this you know this this control matrix so i'm i'm my message is always compassion and community and love and kinship and uh you know and coming together as a united front opposed to division so i personally believe from my perspective that this um, has actually made me a stronger more awakened researcher and uh you know seeker of wisdom and that i'm more ready to gallop down any and every um you know uh, forbidden path that no one else is you know willing to go down so i've got all my guns out i'm gonna die with my boots on and i'm i'm pushing headstrong into this uh into this research and honestly i'm kind of done with the with the flatter stuff for now and i'm 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 pushing headstrong forward into a lot of other uh topics I'm really interested in what Johan has to, uh, you know, where he's taking some of his research to, because a lot of that stuff fascinates me. Some of the biblical and scriptural um, translations is not my specialty, but I'm very kindred and sympathetic to to it because it seems to be coming from a, a place of, uh, you know, of of love and 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 true, you know, caring for the human condition. I think this is a great way for us to wind down and sign off because we did hit on a lot of topics. But, Johan, let's uh, let's hear a lot about what you're working on right now uh, before we uh, sign off for the day. Yeah, I'm looking at what's going to happen in the very near future. And what if I told you that it doesn't matter if, if Trump or Clinton wins the election on November 8th because neither of them will be inaugurated on January the 20th. Barack Obama will continue to be the president of the USA, but then on the martial law. That's the prediction that I'm doing here. That is the prediction I'm doing here in the show. And if I'm wrong, then you can <laughs> you can mock me as much as you want. But I think that's that will be the the way to bring us into the third world war. Now, Johan, I hear a lot of people out there saying that. Can you say why you feel that way? 
And it seems that Watson agrees with you as well. It seems it seems reasonable. Please continue, Watson. Then I do. Oh no, no, I don't want to interrupt you, but I generally, I, I definitely can see something, uh, some variation of that happening, and I would not be surprised if there was, if the elections were compromised, and if he was put in place, and some type of crisis scenario happened, and martial law was established. But again, you know, it's all speculation. Uh, but I just think we're we're being ran by psychopaths at the helm of a diabolical, super dark, evil cabal, and that you know, um, uh, anything could happen. However tragic or or cataclysmic it could be uh, i i i wouldn't put them past it i think that in part that's why they don't care that this flat earth conversation is going to get out similar to the johan sentiment is that it's not going to matter if they collapse the system or if world if, there, if the third world war happens because the last thing you're going to be wondering about you know if the earth is flat around is where you're going to eat next or what kind of shelter you have or what paramilitary hired thugs from you know some some blackwater fronts going to be rolling up on your street trying to disarm you or what kind of like pandemic they're going to unleash on us i don't know i mean so many there's so many possibilities of that not that that's going to happen or but i would not be surprised if, if something shocking what was in the not so distant future as a human humanity we need a global implosion all the systems are corrupt the financial system the healthcare system you, you know all that and we are not able to break free of that because most people have too much interest in keeping the status quo and the people who want that they already have the money and the power so nothing is going to change unless we have to change and we get a sense of urgency when there is a huge global crisis and of course an, a, a war between russia and the usa is such a global crisis especially if china joins it so uh, and i think it's necessary of course many people will have a really tough time and there will be many casualties but i think humanity needs this kind of uh, of yeah huge transformation process in order to break free from the major corruption corruption at all levels yeah, including NASA, in, in, including everything we discussed here, but it goes as, as deeper as many people can suspect because most of the things that we are taught at school, they are wrong. They're all part of a mind control program and the only way to break free from it is to let it all collapse and then we can all start from a clean sheet. So I think that's the future that we will uh, live in very soon. So we will not, it will be, not be the next generation. We are the generation of the end times. I'm 100% certain of that. And that means that we need to prepare. We need to prepare for the tough times that are going. We should not go into fear. That's not helping. But we should be aware that what Daniel, the prophet that Daniel was speaking about, is about to happen. Well, they've done it before. The 20th century was riddled with one, you know, uh, war after another, and uh, the the democide that occurred uh, to the general populace was, you know, was just uh, was just another form of, of, of uh, you know, of, of a killing machine that was. Um, that, well, the, the, for probably based on some e eugenics agenda, but I come, you know, yeah, it's it's wild. I don't. I mean, you you, you got to look at the past and see what they did in the 20th century to us, and why wouldn't they herald in another golden era of uh, military industrial uh, suppression? That's why, in part, I think that they don't care about all this stuff getting out, all of us talking, because if something tragic happens, the last thing we're going to have is to be able to sit around and casually be philosophical about the control system that just, you know, pulled the plug on uh, on us all. We're going to be worried about, you know, a lot other more intense things. Mm -hmm. I agree with both of you there. <laughs> Yeah, can I can I end um, can I end with a with a with a kind of a, a on a closing note that um, generally celebrates I think what's happening in in the truth movement or the alt movement is that everybody is really seeking the similar things similar to what Jason said earlier we're all in search of Gnostic wisdom we're all in search of truth we're pining to have a handle on the human condition we're trying to get control of a uh, of a you know of a of a of a riddle or a conundrum to to maybe get us closer to the source or get us closer to you know to maybe our true self or to a you know to a to a closer feeling of oneness with this big divine riddle and there's this awesome kind of Gandhi quote that I found in my research I'd like to kind of like uh, throw out there really quick and it's a pretty powerful so I'll 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 say it concisely here we go Gandhi many people especially ignorant people want to punish you for speaking the truth, for being correct, for being you. Never apologize for being correct or for being years ahead of your time. 
If you're right and you know it, speak your mind. Speak your mind even if you are a minority of one. The truth is still the truth. And the convoluted tapestry of truthers out there, we're all seeking the same thing. We're all working on our, on our different parts of this big tapestry. And everything, every topic, every researcher, every, every field of inquiry is just as important as the other. And that we should all just continue to seek the truth and know that what we're doing is right and that we're on the right path. And that, you know, whatever our karmic imprint is going to be, in whatever fate we might have, at least we can rise up on the far side of the transcendental mystic veil of death and know that we fought the good fight and we'll be reincarnated on the other side of the resistance with this long lineage of light workers and truth seekers. So I'm going down with my boots on and I'm going to I'm going to go up against this system of lies and deception with, with no reservations. And uh, I'm going to continue to rise up incarnation after incarnation and continue to fight against this dark forces that are, that are inhibiting the human experience. Wonderful. Johan, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I want to finish it right here and right now. I'm not going to do another incarnation. I'm fed up. I'm, uh, I really want... <laughs> No, I really want to end this because there is so much, no, so much uh, suffering going on, and it's completely unnecessary. And yeah. it, it hurts. It hurts me a lot. It causes me a lot of trouble, pain, and and it's it's so unnecessary. And the and the psychopaths that are running the show, they are so sick. So I want to end their game for once and for all. So I'm determined. And it's it's not that I don't dare to speak. I, I It's my life mission to end this. And of course, I cannot do it alone. And I'm very happy that I meet uh, yeah, fantastic guys like you. Because together we can convince the majority who are still very oblig- oblivious to so many things that something is completely wrong. And we can sol- solve this the moment we join hands and the moment we realize that is, it's, it's less than 1% who is fucking it up, excuse my French, for the rest of us. And it's time that we bring them out of power and take the power back to the people. I think we're all in agreement on that. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your time and your, all of your efforts. Uh, Watson, why don't you go ahead and say where uh, people can find you if they want to look into your work further? Absolutely. I've got a website, uh, watsonatkinson.com. It's spelled W A T S U N. A-T-K-I-N-S-U-N dot com. Uh, I changed the spelling from the traditional format to have two sons at the end of both of those names in celebration of what I consider the two luminaries above. The sun and the moon uh, appear to be radiating in their own uh, divine uh, glory. So that's that's the name you can find the dot com. The same name. Um, I'm also on Instagram. You can see a lot of my artwork, a lot of my tattoos, and you can follow me on there. And I've also got a YouTube channel under the same name, with uh, which I don't have not been active on at all for years. It doesn't have any followers. It's barely had any activity. But I recently uploaded a video called Flat Earth Artwork that you can check out, and it uh, shows you a lot of my artwork that is related to this flat earth uh, uh, inspiration. And also there's some older videos in there of me doing performance art, reading poetry on the streets, busking poetry on the street, uh, me doing other performance art, a lot of um, mystic poets I was into, like Attar and Rumi and Hafiz. It has me reading some of their poetry. I've also written some mystic poetry myself. Uh, There's a a long-winded piece called Ocean of Twine that you can take a look at. But yeah, those are my three places, and I'm planning on becoming much more active with distributing poster art that's uh, consciousness-based, truth-based, with a flat-earth undertone and a truth overtone, and also trying to come out more and speak freely to the general populace and to the resistance at large that's that's uh, part of this, this community uh, in similar podcasts like this. And wanted to thank Jason for the opportunity to do this and also thank Johan for his... Um, his charming and sweet debate and insight on everything that he shared with us. And thank you guys. It's been wonderful. Johan, uh, you're a researcher, an author, scientist, lecturer. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, the website I already mentioned is holyscience.org with W double L holy. So it's about the whole and holy with H O L Y means full of holes. So I don't want to have to do anything with that kind of holy, but the wholeness and uh, I've written 37 books so far, but lately I, I switched to videos. I think people are, are a little bit bored by reading books. And my YouTube channel is very active, but you find all the information on that website, holyscience.org. Wow. 
37 books. That's fantastic. Hey, maybe we can exchange some. I'll send you some some posters. You could send me one, you know, a book or two. And um, I'd like to offer that to both of you guys too. And anywhere out there in the Cyberland too that would like a complimentary poster, if you mention that you heard the show on uh, Secrets of Saturn here, um, just send me your address and uh, anywhere on the flat plane, I'll send you a complimentary uh, collection of of of, uh, of posters of, of, of some poster art. Well, I have to say, I'm really pleased with the way this turned out. Uh, everybody kept their cool. Nobody got angry at each other. You just discussed points uh, that, that you felt were very relevant to the discussion. And gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and efforts. And uh, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Washington. Bye for now. Absolutely. Be safe. Peace. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. We just had a debate, if you will, on one of the hottest topics, if not the hottest topic, in alternative media today. This is causing a whole lot of division amongst the truth movement, and I wanted to do a show where this topic could be discussed without any sort of negativity or aggression being brought into the mix. And I think we accomplished that. As always, I invite you to do your own homework, research well, and make your own decisions. But to both of my guests, I say thank you for being outstanding individuals and for just being really cool about the whole thing. Until next time, thank you for listening. 